Have you ever wanted to make your own ROMs from cartridges that you already own? Or better yet, how about transferring the saved game data from a physical cartridge over to an emulator? Well, you're in luck, because today we're going to make the open source cartridge reader. It's a game cart reader that can back up games from over 30 different types of game systems. And it's something that you can build at home for under $40. People have been making backups of their game cartridges for many years now. In fact, I remember discovering the world of game emulation back in the late 90s, and at that time, <laughs> collecting ROM files for the NES. But you might not be that familiar with the term ROM. What does it mean exactly? Well, cartridge-based systems such as the NES need to have a copy of the game code and all the graphics stored on them. And the way you would typically do that is by using read-only memory chips, also known as a ROM. With some of the earlier games, such as this old Nintendo game here, there's only one or two ROM chips, and you could attach clips to it to get to the data that's stored inside. But once you've extracted the data, it needs to be stored in a digital file format that can be preserved and read by computers and other devices. And this is what you would normally call a ROM file. When you have a ROM file that contains the data that was in a cartridge's ROM chips, you can use it to play the game in a software or hardware emulator, such as RetroArch or the Mister. Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, I dreamed of being able to make ROMs from the game cartridges that I already owned. But back then, I didn't even know where to start. But today, this process is a lot easier thanks to the wide availability of microcontrollers like the Arduino and open source projects like the open source cartridge reader. This device is a standalone ROM dumper that you can insert a game cartridge into, and with the press of a button, you can dump either the ROM or even saved game data to files on an SD card. Whenever I build something like this, I usually end up with extras because I'll typically buy parts for the build in bulk. In this case, I have four extra cartridge readers, and I'm auctioning them all off on eBay. If you want one, this is a great way to support the channel directly, while also getting a cool piece of tech in return. The link to each auction is in the description below. Thank you so much for your support. So today, I'm going to walk you through how to make one of these. And first, we need to talk about the parts. Now, the OSCR wiki does list out all the parts you need. But one thing that's not completely obvious at first is that many of these parts are optional, depending on what types of cartridges you want to be able to read. At its core, you really only need a small subset of the parts listed, and you can pick them up for around $30. First, you need an Arduino Mega Pro, and it has to be a specific version which has five surface mount components, as I'm showing here, to the left of the MCU chip. Along with the Arduino, you also need the OSCR's main PCB. You can download the Gerber file for this board from the GitHub repository and send it off to a PCB fabricator like JLC PCB or PCBWay to get boards made. You're also going to need this specific LCD screen, the MKS Mini 12864. It has to be this screen in particular because you're going to modify it to do something special, which I'll talk about shortly. Fortunately, they're pretty inexpensive. You can pick them up for about $5 each from AliExpress. You're also going to need two sliding switches, a 220 ohm resistor, and a three millimeter LED. Make sure you buy the switches from the link in the OSCR wiki so you can make sure you get the right ones that fit into the board correctly. And finally, you'll need some female pin headers. Now I won't spell out the sizes of these here. You can find the specifics on the OSCR wiki. Okay, so these are all the required parts. Everything else is optional and dependent on what kind of cartridges you want to read and write. If you want to use Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance cartridges, 
then you'll need a Game Boy cartridge slot. And if you want to use any other cartridges besides Game Boy, you'll need a cartridge adapter. Now, there's several different cartridge adapters available, and you can download the Gerbers for those PCBs from the OSCR GitHub. But for this build, I'm going to make the 6-in-1 cartridge adapter, which lets you use cartridges from the Nintendo, Famicom, Super Nintendo, Nintendo 64, Sega Master System, and Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive for my European friends. So we're going to need the PCB for that adapter, and of course some cartridge slots for the various cartridge types, and some extra long 20 millimeter male pin headers. Now these pins are longer than a standard pin header, so you need to make sure you get the right ones. 20 millimeters is the perfect size. Now, if you're wondering where to buy the cartridge slots, AliExpress is the best resource. There's links to each of the various slots in the OSCR wiki, so I recommend just picking them up from there. Now, in addition to all this, there are also a few other optional parts that I wanna recommend. First, it's a good idea to grab a 470 microfarad capacitor for smoothing out the VCC rail and providing a clean signal. And I'd also suggest grabbing an SI5351 clock generator module and a PIC12F629 chip, along with its breakout board. I'll talk more about both of these parts shortly as we encounter them during the build, so you'll get an understanding of what they do and whether or not you might want to include them. And finally, I'm also going to include an N64 controller port. And the reason for this is so that I can read the data off of Nintendo 64 controller packs. Okay, let's start building this thing. We'll start out with our main PCB. Whenever we build out a board, you'll usually hear me say to start with the lowest profile components first. But in this case, I'm going to start by soldering on the Game Boy connector. And the reason for this is that the Game Boy connector is a surface mount component so I can keep my board nice and flat against the table while soldering it. And that gives me more control over the workpiece. Okay, next I'll solder on the 220 ohm resistor. This is just a standard through hole part. And then the three millimeter LED. The longer leg of the LED is the anode, so that leg gets soldered to the circular pad. Next, I'm going to do both of the sliding switches, one for the voltage selection and the other for the power switch. We also have two 10-pin IDC headers that need to be soldered onto the board. These are pretty straightforward, just line them up with the markings on the board and solder them in place. Okay, now we have to solder a few female headers to the board. Some of these headers are non-standard sizes, so you'll have to trim them down from larger ones. The way I like to do this is to first identify where the header needs to be cut. Then I'll use my pliers to pull out the pin that's on the cut line. After that, I'll score the cut line with an X-Acto knife and then use my pliers to snap the header. Sometimes you might actually get a clean break here, but more often than not, it'll be a little jaggedy. So what I like to then do is to file it down to smooth it out. And the process is the same for the double row headers as well, but you'll remove two pins before cutting instead of just one. Once the headers are all cut down to size, we just need to solder them into place. Now I'm going to attach that 470 microfarad electrolytic capacitor. It's the tallest piece, so I saved that for last. And there's one more thing we need to do. We need to solder a wire onto this pad right here. There's not a specific length that you need, but give yourself a couple of inches to work with. We'll talk about what this wire is for in just a minute. And that should be it for the main circuit board. Go ahead and set that aside and get out the Arduino Mega Pro. 
The Arduino Mega Pro microcontroller is the heart of the open source cart reader. By using a Mega as the brains of the reader, the OSCR is able to get away with directly connecting cartridge pins to the microcontroller I.O. pins. Now this is possible because the Arduino Mega is based on the AT Mega 2560 chip, which has 54 input-output pins, enough for just about every retro game cartridge. So next, we need to solder the male pin headers to the Arduino Mega board, and you're going to attach them so that the long side of the headers are on top of the board. One of the challenges with supporting multiple types of game cartridges is that the design of each cartridge differs in a few ways. One of these differences is that not all cartridges use the same voltage level for power and data logic. The chips on board the cartridge need power in order to function, and the game systems will generally operate on one of two different voltages, either 3.3 volts or 5 volts. For example, the original Game Boy and Game Boy Color devices operate on 5 volts, while the Game Boy Advance operates on 3.3 volts. If you feed the cartridge 5 volts when its chips are only designed to work on 3.3 volts, you could potentially damage the game cart. In addition to powering the chips inside the cartridge, the data is read from it using high and low voltage signals. Typically, a signal of around 0 volts is often read as a digital 0, and anything else above, say, the 2 volt range is read as a digital 1. So the Arduino Mega, which is reading those data pins from the cartridge, will either receive a 3.3 volt or a 5 volt signal. To make sure that the cartridges and the Arduino Mega are configured at the right voltage level, the OSCR includes a physical switch that you can use to change the voltage. But this switch is a manual process to change voltages, which, as you can imagine, is error prone. So you don't want to accidentally leave the switch set at 5 volts when a 3.3 volt cartridge is plugged into one of the slots. To help alleviate that possibility, the OSCR includes an optional voltage selection circuit, which will automatically set the correct voltage level based on the cartridge you're dumping. Now, I didn't include it in this build, but there's instructions on the wiki for how to add the automatic voltage selection circuit to the OSCR if you want to include it. But in order to support both 3.3 and 5 volt cartridges, there's a clever little hack that we need to do. And it starts with removing this fuse from the Arduino Mega microcontroller. This is actually a thermal fuse that sits between the incoming 5 volt line from the USB power supply and the AVR microcontroller. If the MCU pulls more than 500 milliamps of current, this fuse kicks in and blocks the current until the device is reset as a protection mechanism. By removing this fuse, we're effectively disconnecting the USB power line from the Arduino. Now, the best way to do this is to just use your soldering iron to heat up each pad and alternate back and forth between them. After a couple of times, the fuse should just come right up. With the fuse now gone, we're going to solder the other end of that wire that we attached to the PCB to the pad that's closest to the USB port. And what this now does is it reroutes the 5 volt power from the USB cable into the OSCR circuit board instead of the Arduino. By doing this, the OSCR can use either the automatic voltage selector circuit or the manual voltage selection switch to choose which voltage level should be fed back into the Arduino Mega to power it. So now you should have the Arduino Mega attached to the OSCR's mainboard with a short wire. But all of you astute viewers will recognize that there's no voltage regulator on the OSCR. So how does it turn that 5 volt USB power into 3.3 volts? Well, this is actually quite clever. Rather than including the regulator circuitry itself, the OSCR uses the 3.3 volt regulator from the LCD screen. That's right, it takes the 3.3 volts from the LCD and backfeeds that signal into the Arduino. I love finding these little design nuggets in projects like this. These clever little hacks keep the PCB design simple while leveraging existing components that we already have 
to lower the cost of the overall board. But in order to use the 3.3 volt regulator in the LCD, we need to make one modification. We need to use some solder to jump these two pads right here. This will make sure the 3.3 volt signal is available on the LCD's connector. Okay, next we'll need to prepare the clock generator module. Now this is listed as an optional component and depending on which types of cartridges you want to read, you may not need it. Some cartridges have chips on them that require a specific clock signal in order to get data out of it. This is primarily Super Nintendo cartridges with an enhancement chip, such as the SA-1 or the SPC-7110. And honestly, the list of cartridges that have these chips is relatively small, so it might not be worth including the clock generator if you don't have any of those games. But there is one other scenario where you may need the clock generator, and that's if you want to copy saved games off Nintendo 64 cartridges. Most N64 game packs store saved game data in EEPROM, which is basically programmable memory. To access the EEPROM on a Nintendo 64 cartridge, a 2 MHz clock signal is required. So you need the clock generator to produce that signal. The SI5351 clock generator module is already put together for the most part. The only thing you need to do is solder the male pin header in place. And then the clock generator just connects to our PCB right here. Okay, that should be everything for the OSCR's mainboard. All that's left is to attach the Arduino Mega. Just be careful not to yank off the power wire that you soldered on earlier. We're not actually done yet, but this is enough for us to go ahead and test the unit out. First, you need to attach the LCD module using the two ribbon cables that came with it. Make sure you attach the EXP1 header on the LCD to the EXP1 header on the OSCR and do the same for EXP2. And then we need to plug it into a computer, set it to five volts and turn it on so we can load up the Arduino sketch. If you flashed Arduino sketches before, then this process is going to be very familiar to you. First, you need to download the latest release from the OSCR's GitHub repository and extract it to a folder on your computer. They made loading the sketch super easy. You'll notice that there's a folder called Arduino IDE Portable in the files you extracted. If you're on a Windows PC, then all you have to do is go into that folder and double click the Arduino executable. What they've done is included the portable version of the Arduino IDE which just runs from disk without having to be installed. And this version of Arduino is actually already pre-configured. So when it loads up, all you have to do is open the cart reader program from the sketchbook menu. There are a couple of options that we need to change before we can upload the sketch. Open up the config.h file and first uncomment line 32. This tells the sketch that we're using version five of the hardware. Also, I included the clock generator in this build, so we also need to uncomment line 55. And then we can scroll down and uncomment the lines for the different cartridges that we want to be able to read. The cartridge types that are supported by the six in one adapter that I'm building are already uncommented, so there's nothing further for me to do here. But if you decide to build additional cartridge adapters, you'll need to uncomment those lines in the config file before uploading the sketch. After you make these changes, you just need to make sure the correct COM port is selected for your board, and then just click Upload. There's one final thing we need to do before we can test it out. You need to insert a fresh SD card into your computer and copy the contents of the SD card folder over to the root of that card. Then turn the OSCR off Insert the SD card into the LCD module and turn the OSCR on. If everything worked correctly, you should be greeted with a glowing menu of cartridge options. Even though we only have the Game Boy port connected at this point, this is enough to give it a spin and make sure it actually works. And I'm going to test it out 
by dumping this Tetris cartridge into a ROM file. Regular Game Boy cartridges use 5 volts, and I already have the switch set, so there's nothing to change there. So all I have to do is select Game Boy in the menu, and you notice that it reads the header from the cartridge. Then I can choose the option to read the ROM, and it dumps the ROM to a file on the SD card. Okay, let's test out the ROM file. I've put the SD card into my computer where I have RetroArch installed, and I'll browse for the ROM file on the SD card. You'll notice that it places each cartridge dump into a folder organized by the system. And if it recognizes the cartridge, it'll name the file accordingly. And it looks like it worked great. Okay, well, the Game Boy cartridge slot seems to be working. And if all you wanted was Game Boy games, you could stop here. But I want to build the 6-in-1 adapter as well. And for this board, I'm going to start off with this 1 kilo ohm resistor, which will connect to the N64 controller's data line. Make sure the resistor is mounted on the bottom side of the adapter board. That's the side that has the labels on each pin. And I'm also going to solder wires onto each of these pins for the controller port. Give yourself maybe 3 or 4 inches of slack to work with here, and make sure you solder the wires to the same side of the board as the resistor. Then we'll need an 8-pin female header, which we're going to mount right here. Next, we'll need to solder on our 20 millimeter pin headers. Remember that these are extra long headers. Don't use standard sized headers here. The ones I have come in rows of 40 pins, so I'll need to break them down to a 38 pin and a 36 pin connector. And when you mount these, make sure the long side of the connectors is on the same side of the board as the resistor. Now for the fun part, soldering on the cartridge slots. These are all going to attach to the top of the board, not the bottom. You might find that you'll have to play with individual pins and bend them just a tad to get them all to line up. Just be careful not to force it too hard and squish a pin. When soldering these, I strongly recommend that you use a fume extractor. We have quite a bit of soldering here, and you really don't want to be breathing in all these fumes. Now you can go ahead and solder the wires onto the N64 port. Okay, we're almost done. To wrap up the build, I want to turn your attention to this guy. This is a PIC microcontroller. Some Super Nintendo games contain a chip called the Super Accelerator 1, or SA1, as you'll often see it written. The SA1 chip has copy protection built in, so if it doesn't see that there's a checking integrated circuit or CIC chip, present inside the Super Nintendo, then it's not going to unlock the chip and let you get to the data. Since we don't have a Super Nintendo connected to the cartridge, the PIC microcontroller here is going to emulate the CIC chip. There are a couple of different ways that you can program this chip, but I'm using this programmer, which is called the TL8662. This is a great, fairly inexpensive chip programmer that you can use not only for programming chips, but also dumping EEPROMs and all sorts of other fun stuff. You just need to place the chip into the programmer, clamp it down, and then bring up the programmer software on your computer. We'll tell the software what kind of chip we're programming, a PIC12F629. And then give it the file with the data to flash onto it. In this case, I'm telling it to flash this hex file, which I downloaded from the OSCR's GitHub repository. Now, if you don't own a programmer and don't want to buy one, you can purchase these chips 
pre-flashed. There's links in the OSCR wiki with places where you can buy one of these pre-programmed chips from. Once it's flashed, we need to remove it from the programmer and solder it onto this little breakout board. We'll also need to include this 0.1 microfarad capacitor, which just functions as a basic decoupling cap for this chip. And finally, we have one more male pin header to attach. This is just a standard length header that sits on top of the board. After we're done, our emulated CIC chip just attaches underneath the cartridge adapter board. And then we just need to sandwich it together. Okay, we now have a fully functioning open source cartridge reader, but I don't think we want it sitting here with the bare PCBs exposed. So I found this really nice housing that someone made on printables, and I gave the board its forever home in this new case. And yeah, it turned out really nice. Before ending this video, I wanna try one other scenario that this device should be capable of. I have a game of Super Mario World that I've been playing on my other devices. In my last video on the Analog Pocket, I showed you how you can synchronize saved games between the Analog Pocket and the Mister. But now I wanna take it to the next level and see if I can take some of the saved game data from one of my hardware emulators and inject it into the actual cartridge. So I copied my Super Mario World save file from the Pocket's SD card over to the OSCR's SD card. And I place Super Mario World into the Super Nintendo slot on the cart reader. I chose the option to write the save file and selected the saved game file that I copied to the SD card. Okay, it looks like it succeeded. So let's try it out. I have my Super Nintendo here hooked up to my projector through my RetroTINK 5X. And yep, it worked perfectly. Well, I have to say that I'm super pleased with this project and how nicely it turned out. It's a really neat experience making your own ROMs from the games you own. And as you saw, you can use this device to shuttle saved game files back and forth to cartridges. Well, that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you end up building one of these cart readers yourself, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear about your own experiences building one. All right, I'll see you next time. And as always, until then, go make something cool.